Good morning. Please stand with me as we look to the Word of God. The passage that we're about to read here was uh, chosen by Elaine, and it was suggested by me to read it from her Bible, but my Braille's pretty bad anymore. Um, so I'm just going to read it from here, and this is the New Living Translation. It is referring to the resurrection of the body. 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 58. But someone may ask, how did the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will they have? What a foolish question. When you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. And what you put into the ground is not the plant that will grow, but only a bare seed of wheat or whatever you are planting. Then God gives the new body that he wants to, for it to have. A different plant grows from each kind of seed. Similarly, there are different kinds of flesh. One kind for humans, another kind for animals, another kind for birds, and another kind for fish. There are also bodies in heaven and bodies on earth. The glory of the heavenly bodies is different from the glory of the earthly bodies. The sun has one kind of glory, while the moon and stars each have another kind. And each of the stars differ from each other in their glory. It is the same with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to life forevermore. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as they are natural bodies, they are also spiritual ones. The scripture tells us the first man, Adam, became a living person. But the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body, then the spiritual body comes later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from the glories of heaven. Each person are like the earthly man, and heavenly people are like heavenly man. Just as we now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in the moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when a trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to life forevermore, and we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thanks be to God. He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and be immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this opening scripture. I thank you for the reality that our bodies here on this earth are but temporary and they will pass away, but they'll become a glorified day that we'll be reunited with you once more. We thank you for Elaine, Lord. We thank you for her life, the life she lived, how she touched each one of us. And Lord, we pray your blessing upon this service that not only may it glorify her name, but it may glorify you. In your name we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning and welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for being here today. My name is Pastor Todd, and I had the privilege of knowing Elaine for 10-plus years here at Pittman's EC Church as her pastor. Sadly, I heard the news of her passing abruptly and bluntly, like I fear most of you have. I was just getting ready to do the Sunday service right here at this church when but five minutes before the service, I was given the news. 
Needless to say, I was startled. I just saw her in the hospital a little while ago, and I was expecting her to bounce back, if you know what I mean. I mean, after all, we're talking about Elaine here. And if anyone could power through challenges and things like this, it would be her. I expected her to do well, but God clearly had other plans. I remember standing before this congregation last Sunday and emotionally breaking this hard news to everyone. There were audible gasps throughout the congregation everywhere. People were surprised, they were astonished. Most didn't even know how sick she really was. Because if you know anything about Elaine, you know her to be a pretty private person, a tough-willed individual. She was resilient and never wanted to burden anyone or you with her problems. Know that she was very strong in her faith to the very end. She knew Jesus Christ, and more importantly than that, Jesus Christ knew her. And the one comforting thing that I want you all to know as we start the service today is that she is having the very best New Year's out of all of us. She is having the best New Year's of her life, for she is in glory with God. Congratulations, everyone. You have already started your new year. It's 2024, and there's going to be future challenges, pains, struggles for you. And Lord save us all, there's going to be a presidential election. You will have worries. You will have future unknowns, but not Elaine, my friends. She started her New Year's out perfectly unlike us, for now she's in eternal glory with her Savior, Jesus Christ. And no more future worries, no more pain, complete healing, complete maturity. Good luck achieving that in your new year here on earth. Simply put, you can mourn for the loss of Elaine today. It is expected. It is welcome here. But please don't you ever forget, she's having the new years of her life and eternity in heaven right now. Speaking of heaven, there's a special family, the Snyder family, that was requested to do a, a number that Elaine asked them to do. It was called I Searched Heaven. And uh, as this is a very immers- uh, emotional time for all of us, they wanted to pre-record it for you to hear because they were not sure if they would be able to do it up front here live at the time. So uh, please have your attention to the screen. Good morning. We are the Snyder family. I am Stacy, Nathan, Mary, Rachel, Laura, Judy. We're good friends at Randy and Elaine, and we are honored that Randy has asked us to sing this song, which Elaine has requested. I dream that I've gone to that city, that city where never comes night, and I saw the bright angels of glory, I saw the fair mansions of life, I gazed for Streets of 
gold pavement I trod. The faces of saints by the millions. I scanned in my yearning to see the face I had cherished so fondly. The face that had grown dear to me. I asked the ten thousand sweet angels, have you seen my beloved one, pray tell? Have you met in the bright halls of heaven, the one who honored thy love well? They shook their heads sadly and wonderful song indeed and now it's your time to sing with us i ask you that you please stand we go to your hymnal in front of you it is most likely blue and it is hymn number 434 what a friend we have in jesus 434 please stand with me
Thank you. You may be seated. And at this time, a, a very, very good friend of Elaine, Carla, um, has a little something that she wants to say about crowns. This is a devotional um, from Johnny Erickson Tata from her book, Diamonds in the Dust, and it's called Crowns. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10. Adults poo-poo the idea of rewards in heaven, but children don't. Like a student before his teacher, a child squirms in delight at the anticipation of a reward, much less a jeweled crown of his very own. Maybe that's why Jesus said, the children are best fit for the kingdom of heaven. The kid in me would love, just love a crown in heaven. What's the big deal about crowns? The Bible celebrates the crowning day in 2 Corinthians 5.10, and goes on to mention specific crowns. The crown of life, mentioned in James 1.12, is reserved for those who persevere under trials and withstand under God's tests. The crown of rejoicing, in 1 Thessalonians 2.19, is a reward for believers who introduce others to Jesus. The incorruptible crown, in 1 Corinthians 9.25 is for those who are found to be pure and blameless on the judgment day. And in 1 Peter 5.2-4, there's a special crown reserved for Christian leaders who have guided others. It even says that the chief shepherd himself will present that crown. But the child in me jumps up and down to think that I might be rewarded the crown talked about in 2 Timothy 4.8. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not just to me, but also to all those who long for his appearing. Heavenly crowns are not just rewards for a job well done on earth. Crowns are a glorious consummation of the job itself. How I long to hear you say, Lord, well done, good and faithful servant, what a reward that will be. Elaine has heard those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And she has all these crowns that she can lay at Jesus' feet, who she sees perfectly, with perfect eyes now. Let us pray. Lord God, there are many crowns of glory that will be given to your faithful servants. You are so good, true, and fair that you actually choose to honor us as we honor you. Elaine has clearly done that throughout her life. Yes, she was not perfect, but Lord, she was faithful. So God, if it be your will, may you reward her with many well-deserved crowns on that wonderful day of your return. Until then, God, Help us all to serve you well. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when death comes, it brings with it many questions, many questions by people. And one of the bigger questions asked by some is, what happens to our bodies when we pass on? Yes, our bodies do go back into the ground, but is there more? Is there more that happens? to those like Elaine that are trusting in Jesus Christ. Scripture answers the call of this question. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 10 states, For we know that when this tent we live in is now taken down, when we die and leave these bodies, we will have wonderful new bodies in heaven, homes that will be ours forevermore, made for us by God himself, not by human hands. How weary we grow of our present bodies. That is why we look forward eagerly to the day when we shall have heavenly bodies 
and we will put them on like brand new clothes. For we shall not be merely spirits without bodies. These earthly bodies make us groan, they make us sigh. But we won't be like that or think of our dying bodies as well. We want to slip into our new bodies so that these dying bodies will, as it were, be swallowed up by everlasting life. This is what God has prepared for us. As a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. Scripture continues on in verse 6. Now we look forward with confidence to our heavenly bodies, realizing that every moment that we spend in this, or on our earthly bodies is time spent away from our eternal home in heaven with Christ Jesus. We know these things are truly by believing and not just by seeing. And we are not afraid, but are quite content to die, for we know that we will be at home with the Lord. So our aim is to please him always in everything that we do, whether we're here in this body or away from this body and with him in heaven forevermore. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged and have our lives laid bare before him. Each of us will receive whatever he deserves for the good or the bad things he has done in his earthly body. Our loved one, Elaine, understands this passage much better than we do right now. Let us go to your hymnal. You remain seated. Hymn number 240, You Said You'd Come. Hymn 240. Jesus. 
Elaine picked out many scripture passages to comfort you and to help you in this time. And uh, another one that she gave is uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord in heaven, in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. And Elaine wanted to encourage you with these words too. Let's pray and prepare our hearts for God's message today. Lord, we humbly kneel before you in this time of tribulation, this time of hurt, time of sorrow, but also a time of rejoicing, knowing that one of your saints, Elaine, has gone on to glory to be with you. Lord, we pray pray your blessing uh, upon Randy as he comes forth to give this message. Uh, We thank you for the time that he has dedicated to come here. He's a very busy individual, but uh, there's a relationship there, Lord, that is unbelievable. And I thank you for their friendship that they have. So, Lord, may we have attentive ears to hear this message and this passage specifically picked out from Elaine for us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to Pastor Randy Sizemore. Not only is he our bishop of our EC denomination, but more importantly, he was Elaine's friend in a great many years, so. He wants to share with you some of the thoughts and insights about Elaine and also for you to consider the passage today of Scripture and the encouragement that the Lord has for you. Thank you. Well, good morning. Yeah, we don't need to know. Before we get to the message, I do want to share some memories and thoughts about Elaine. And uh, after I'm done, you have an opportunity to do that as well. So if you would like to share something, you can have that opportunity. We'll pass a microphone around if you can't. I totally understand that. Um, I do a lot of funerals. This is probably one of the hardest ones uh, that I need to do today. Born in Allentown... Elaine was a daughter of the late Walter A. Benfield and Alberta M. Moe Benfield and was a 1971 graduate of Brandywine Heights High School, Topton. She then attended Kutztown University and and Potomac Horse Center in Maryland, where she became certified in stable management, horse training, and giving lessons. From 1973 until 1980, Elaine operated Starlet Stables in the Huffs Church area. Elaine and Randy were married on September the 20th, 1975. After moving to Pittman, i.e. Paradise, Elaine continued to care for horses on her neighboring farms until 2003. She also served as the secretary for Randy's portable sawmill business, Hidden Springs Homestead, and at his secretary while he was serving as the certified sewage and enforcement officer into his retirement. Elaine was a devout Christian and a former member of Huff's Union Church and later became very involved here at Zion EC Church in Pittman. She held weekly devotions at Friendly Nursing Home in Pittman, taught Sunday school, was the president of the Missionary Society, and oversaw the church calendar. As a blind person, Elaine was an advocate for others living with blindness and visual impairments. For nearly 20 years, Elaine was the coordinator for what we call the VIPs, the visually impaired people, the group that came to Herndon Camp Meeting every July. She was also a member of the Lehigh Valley Council of the Blind. 
Elaine loved to trail ride, had a deep love for animals, including her two beloved guide dogs, Trey and Flora. And I think that's Trey up there on the screen. Is that right, Randy? Yeah. She loved reading or listening to audio books. Uh, she even led a woman's book club. In addition to her husband of 48 years, Randy, Elaine is also survived by her two older sisters, Jeanette and Lois, three nephews, Matthew, Jonathan, and Timothy, two nieces, Karen and Kathleen, and of course their families. Along with her parents, Elaine was predeceased by her brother Clark in 2001 and her niece Valerie in 2023. Now, that's what you learn about Elaine if you read the obituary. But you can never capture a person's life in a few paragraphs. So each of you here today have memories and experiences of your lifetime with Elaine, and you could add pages and pages and pages about her life. Carla and I became friends with Elaine and Randy, I think about 20 years ago through Herndon Camp Meeting. And uh, in all those years, whether we were in Pennsylvania or in Illinois, wherever, we enjoyed lots of visits and meals around the table. Um, ice cream cones, sandwiches at the Crossroads Auction. Um, Randy has helped us, you know, with electrical projects in our home, and both Randy and Elaine have taken an active interest in our kids' lives. And, and I know that Carla and, and Elaine were, were really close. Um, I think the two Randys were an afterthought with Carla and Elaine, so we just happened to be there. So when I was elected to serve as the executive director of global ministries for the EC Church, tasked with overseeing uh, missionaries and international churches, I asked Elaine to be part of a very small prayer team on my behalf, and she agreed. And she took that very seriously, and she did that with excellence. When I was consecrated bishop of the EC Church, Randy and Elaine came as our guests of honor, which we really appreciated because none of our family could attend. They represented all uh, for us. And so like you, last Sunday morning when we got the news that the Lord wanted Elaine with her, we were shocked. And we've spent the week crying and remembering and probably asking God what you were asking God, you know why, and Carla and I, you know, were thinking about all these things we remembered about Elaine, and so I just wrote down a list here. They're not in any sense of order, but things that I noted about Elaine's life. Elaine never used her blindness as an excuse. As a matter of fact, a lot of times I forgot she was blind. We'd go to her house, and she'd make meals, and we'd talk, and I'd say, did you see this, and did you see that? And she'd say yes. She never used it as an excuse. And Randy can tell you that a lot of things that looked from our end, it looked like it was easy for Elaine to do. It was really hard for her to do, but not impossible. She did it. Elaine was adventurous, if you knew anything about her. I mean, she just recently took a train trip, right, I think, to, to Virginia by herself. Um, adventurous. Um, Elaine was either, and you can choose the word you want, she was either persistent, tenacious, or stubborn. So you can choose. Oh. Um, which word you want to use there. And, and I do want to say this, you know, Randy, I watched you guys. You were great life partners. I watched you guys when we were at your house and with you around and, and how you just worked so well together. And Randy, how you took good care of Elaine, even though she most of the time didn't want you to take care of her, right? I know that too, uh, but you did really well. So well done. I want to make sure that we, we say that. And um, I know she loved loved you and appreciated all of that. We used to talk about her Randy and my, when Carla and her would talk, it would be your Randy or my Randy. So that was good. This is what Elaine loved. She loved Jesus. She loved Randy. She loved her family. She loved her church. She loved her friends. She loved animals. She loved chocolate. She loved cheesecake. She loved ice cream, dot, 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 dot. She loved life. I mean, if you spend any time with Elaine, she wasn't a whiner or a complainer. She loved life. She loved God's word. She always had questions about God's word. She was always reading and studying and, of course, teaching others about God's word. I think the thing that impressed me was she was an avid reader of all genres of books. You know, she led a book club. 
which is amazing to me because not everyone in the club was blind. There were sighted people in the club and she led the club. She was a lifelong learner, always learning something, <clears throat> this or that or the other thing, and was able to remember a lot of what she learned. She, she was a gifted leader. I don't think she would say that. Like if I said, Elaine, you're a gifted leader, she would say no. She never thought she did things good enough or well enough or fast enough or whatever, but she definitely was a gifted leader. And the one thing that we all appreciate about Elaine is you never needed to wonder what she was thinking. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's the joy of the people who live in these parts of Pennsylvania. You know, we just pretty much tell you, even before you ask, what we're thinking. And uh, we, we really appreciate that. So Elaine was one of those people that if you had in your life, you were blessed. And uh, I think our lives will not be as full or complete without Elaine in our lives. But her influence will continue and, and continue to bring us comfort, continue to bring us a smile, encourage us to be adventurous, to love Jesus, to be, to be students of his word. Um, we'll remember our time with her on this earth with fondness. And as believers, we get to look forward to that time when uh, we'll actually get to see her again. And she'll get to see us. Now, she might be disappointed with what some of us look like, but... <laughs> Well, we will have a glorified body, so it'll be all right. Um, much more, you know, can be said, and we certainly appreciate the friendship of Randy and Elaine in, in our lives, and we'll continue to do so as well. So how about you? Anyone else have a, a memory you would like to share, a brief memory, or something you'd like to share about Elaine? I see a hand back there. Hi everyone, I'm Jeanette, Le Elaine's oldest sister. Her other sister, our middle sister, is also here, Lois. She's sitting over on the other side. Uh, sitting next to me here is my son, Tim. Uh, Elaine, of course, was his aunt. And my daughter would have loved to be here, but she died September 21st of 2023. The things I want to say about Elaine, I'm going to start with her as a baby. She was 11 years younger than I, and so I always told her that I practiced on her for my babies. <laughs> I remember rocking her in the rocking chair and giving her her bottle. You mentioned Randy that she was stubborn. I think thanks to my father and maybe our ancestors before that, it's in our genes. My father was blind. He was an amazing man. He also taught Sunday school and became um, a very, very competent businessman. He had three offices. But that's enough about him. Um, all four of my dad's children inherited his eye condition. Unfortunately, my brother died at the age of 52. But my sister Lois, who is here, and myself have shared that heritage of the vision loss. I think that's all that I wanted to share. Thank you, everyone who loved my sister. Thank you. Uh, I can't, don't even know how many years ago I met Elaine, but uh, um, certainly shared her love of horses. But uh, we, uh, if I think of one thing that I'd add to that list up there is she was a prayer warrior. Um, there was never a National Day of Prayer that passed without her saying, are we doing something for that? Are we doing, <laughs> she, she, or and we met so often uh, just to pray together. She was so focused on that. And um, 
she just amazed, like she, I'm sure she amazed everybody, but she amazed me. She did a Bible study in a nursing home in Pottsville and went there by herself on a regular basis to meet with elderly people and, and tell them about Jesus, and she just amazed me. Um, but the, the last thing I want to say is on Sunday when we got the news and Todd was preaching about the plow, where you put your eyes on Jesus, put your plow in the ground, and just keep walking towards him, that is what she did. And um, she did not let the rocks of blindness in the way and all that stop her. She just kept walking towards Jesus, and she's such a good example, and the, the, the sermon was just perfect that day. So, Randy, I just wanted to say how fortunate I feel to have seen you and Elaine in September, not too long ago, and to have shared memories with Elaine um, while we were there. And I guess the memory I'll share with everyone here is how important and, and how much I appreciate Randy and Elaine letting me spend summer vacations with them where I got to work for Elaine. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to do things with Randy. Thank you. My name is Barbara Updegrave. My husband is Bob. We met Randy and Elaine 32 years ago when we moved into the area. Uh, she was amazing. Had a huge, huge vegetable garden. Uh, she did her own canning. We had horses in common, dogs and cats in common. Uh, she really was amazing. The way she got around at that point, she was still able to do a lot, and but never complain. Never complain about her being blind or having problems. She just kept moving forward. Uh, a lot of people respected her for that, and I was glad, and I'm still glad to know Elaine and Randy. Thank you. Todd up front here, yeah. Okay. Sorry. I don't really know what I want to say. Uh, I am the middle child, so if you're a middle child, you understand me. <laughs> um, just so blessed to be in the family I was in. Uh, my dad had very bad vision, and he never stopped. And Elaine, of course, was totally blind, and nothing stopped her either. And it's just a, a privilege to have so many people to inspire, not just me, but the next generations instead. Um, Elaine and I talked quite frequently. I'm going to miss that. <laughs> She was my confidant and just loved her dearly. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Elaine was my aunt and Randy my uncle and I have so many great memories of them. The things that Elaine has brought into my life of uh, I still enjoy as much today as I did as a little girl. Spent a lot of summers at grandma's house and then I would spend a lot of time, sometimes a week at a time with Elaine and Randy. I remember in Huff's church rolling out mashed potatoes and her teaching me that mashed potatoes are for potato candy, not, <laughs> not Thanksgiving meal. And uh, I remember sitting on their front porch and snapping beans and things as I grew up in Washington DC so this was an escape and an opportunity to enjoy the very fine simplest things in life and just find the romance and intimacy and doing those very special things with people that are just so caring I remember sitting in Randy and Elaine's house up in the basement by the wood stove and just 
for an hour maybe at a time just loving on their little dog Jerry which was literally my favorite dog ever and their horse Penny I just I remember coming up here in the summer and Elaine would pack me some food and give me the horse and say, when you're ready to come home, you can put the rain down. That horse will lead you right back home. Uh, I have a, a horse today because of Elaine and Randy, and I have a love for animals because of them, because of Elaine's and her love for canning. I, I pureed all my own baby food thinking that that made me special. <laughs> But I just have so much love for for this family and for Elaine and Randy. They are, I don't know, godparents to me, maybe. And, yeah, I have four kids that are very close together, and we brought them here, and they played in their diapers and their crick, <laughs> which is not a word that I use, but uh, there's so much, so much love for what they have brought into my life, and I'm so thankful for them. Anyone else like to share? All right, well, thank you for sharing, and you know, today and tomorrow and throughout the weeks, uh, continue to talk about those things that you remember about Elaine and, and allow her memory to continue to influence your life. I think it's always helpful to hear what others say about our loved ones on a day like today, um, but it's essential that we hear what God has to say um, today. And of course, as you know, Elaine would say the very same thing. Um, David wrote these words, you know them, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Every time I think about that psalm, especially on a day like today, I always think about how could David have such a bold statement of confidence, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And he actually answers the question for us. He says in verse 4, because you are with me. I love that image of the horse. Just drop the reins, the horse knows the way to go. We have a good shepherd who says, look, just friends, just drop the reins and let me lead you. I think the psalmist can kind of look down the history and, and maybe understand what the writer to the Hebrews said about death. Hebrews 2, 15 says, Jesus destroyed him who holds the power of death that is the devil, and has freed those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. And the one thing we learn about Jesus is he does not want us to be in slavery concerning fear of death. He replaces that fear with, with a living hope. Peter writes about that in 1 Peter to his congregation. This is what he says, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. <clears throat> though you do not now see him, you believe in him 
and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I just want to share three simple things with you today from, from the Word of God that Jesus wants you to know, and that is that we do not need to fear death. Jesus has given us a living hope. <clears throat> Verse 3 says, excuse me, <clears throat> Verse 3 says that we have this living hope. We are born again to a living hope. Now, you know the famous verse, everybody has it memorized, that tells about this. John chapter 3, verse 16. God so loves the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, would not die, would not cease to exist, would not just evaporate into nothingness, but would have everlasting life. That's our hope. This is not a hospital hope. You know what the hospital hope is. Elaine and Randy went through that. The hospital hope is we're going to try this and try that and hope it works. That's not the kind of hope Jesus gives. This is, this is for sure hope. This is for sure. Jesus said, look, I'm so sure of this. I'm going to go make a place ready for you. Remember in John 14, after the crucifixion and the resurrection, Jesus is with his followers, and then he's got to leave them. And they're upset because it's an upsetting day when you have to say goodbye to someone you love. So Jesus says to them, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. In other words, I'm telling you the truth. I'm going to go prepare a place for you so that where I am, you can be there forever. Now, why would Jesus say that if it wasn't true? Why would he waste his time preparing a place if there was no place for us to go? We understand that our hope in Christ is a living hope. So when a Christian dies, we're not really resting in peace. We, we, we are celebrating with Jesus Christ in joy forever. It's not just a living hope, it's a certain hope. He tells us in verse 4 that this, this inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. In other words, the, the things that affect everything on this planet cannot affect our hope. It can't rust. It can't fade. It can't be stolen. It can't be taken away. It is for certain. I like what Jesus said to, to the thief on the cross. You remember this scene? Jesus is hanging on the cross between the two thieves, and the one thief wants nothing to do with Jesus. And still today, there are people that want nothing to do with Jesus. But, but the other thief turns, and in childlike faith, says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What a simple prayer. But, you know, Jesus isn't really concerned about the words that come out of our mouth. He knows the condition of our heart. And Jesus says to him, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Not tomorrow, not next week, not after you get a few things done, not after years in purgatory, not no, today, this day. This day you'll be with me in paradise. This is a, a certain hope. And for the believer, when we close our eyes in death, immediately... We're in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. This day, you're with me in paradise. That's why I'm so glad that, you know, Elaine, and I'm not surprised she planned the service and all the scriptures, you know Elaine, but I'm glad that she asked us to read that passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 to 18, that says you don't have to be uninformed about what happens when a believer dies. You can know what happens. We don't, we don't grieve like those who have no hope. Now, we're grieving. This has been a tough week, and it will continue to be tough. But it's not like we have no hope, like this is the end. No, we understand that there is hope, not the hospital hope, but the certain hope that those who die with their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ live forever. And those of us who follow will be reunited with those who go before us. Now, our living hope is not based on a preacher or a church it's based on what Jesus did. That's what he says in verse 4. We have this inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, it's unfading, it's kept in heaven for you. And he says in verse 3, this hope comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So we just celebrated Jesus' birth on Christmas. Not too long, we'll celebrate Easter. That's like the Super Bowl for Christians. That's when Jesus says, you can believe me because 
I did exactly what I told you I was going to do. I'm going to die for you, be buried for you, but live again for you. And because I'm resurrected, then you too can be resurrected. Our hope is not based on any other thing except the, the words and the actions of Jesus. So we have a confident hope. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that the thing that maybe prevents people from following Jesus is we're afraid we can't finish what we've started. Because probably in all of our garages and basements and places we have stuff we've started <laughs> and never finished. And we're like, well, I, you know, I think it'd be good to be a Christian and follow Jesus, but I'm afraid I can't really do that for the rest of my life. What if I don't get it right? Here's newsflash. You can't and you won't. You can't get it right and you won't get it right. And that's the good news. Verse 5, listen to verse 5. It says, by God's power, we are being guarded. The word here is like shepherded. We are being guarded or shepherded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In other words, I place my faith in Jesus today and like a good shepherd, he guides me through my life. He knows I can't do it by myself. I can't be perfect. I can't live the way that Jesus wants me to live without him. And he's like, don't worry about it. If I start this in you, I will finish it. Philippians 1, 6. I'm sure of this. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Jesus is like, drop the reins. I got this. I got it. Put your faith in me. Don't worry about how it's all going to work out. If, you know, a year from now you're going to, you know, think, hey, I, I really shouldn't have started this. I can't do it. I think that's part of the fear of death. I think the other part of the fear of death is just standing before an almighty God. Because as nice as we all look this morning, we know what we know about ourselves. And we know that the best we could possibly be is not even close to what God would expect. But again, I want you to think about that, that scene on, on the hill of Calvary where, where the thief on the cross turns to Jesus. Now, if you were ever going to come to Jesus, could you think of a worse possible time to meet Jesus? So you're probably stripped naked. You, you've probably been beaten. You've been convicted of crimes you know you did. You're, you're in the middle of a death penalty. Like, it doesn't get any worse. And you turn there, and there's Jesus. Like, oh, my word, if I knew you were going to be here, I would have cleaned up a little bit. Here's the great thing about Jesus. There's nothing in your life that you have done or can do that would make Jesus run away screaming, thinking, oh, my word, I can't handle that. It's too bad. This is what the Bible says. The Bible says this. God shows his love for us in that while we are sinners at our worst possible state, Christ died for us. He didn't even notice what the guy on the cross looked like or what he did. He didn't ask him, were you innocent or guilty? He, he just said, today you'll be with me in paradise. When we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, of course, it's a little bit unnerving to think about standing before an almighty God. But when you realize that he saved you at your worst... And that his goal is to present you before the Father as your best, it kind of takes the fear away. Ephesians chapter 5 tells us that <clears throat> the goal of Jesus for all of our lives is not to make us theologians, not to make us great Sunday school teachers. Actually, he says the goal of Jesus for all of our lives is to present us before the Father like a bride on her wedding day. Now, some of us men are going to have a hard time understanding that, but if you've ever been involved in a wedding, you know it takes an awful lot of money and time, an entire army, to get a bride ready for her wedding day, right? You've got to have the shoes, you've got to have the dress, you've got to have the jewelry, you've got to have the makeup, you've got to get the nails done, you've got to get the hair done. It's like, oh my word, how much work does it take? But the bride has to be perfect on the wedding day. So when finally the music plays and the bride comes down the aisle, there, there it is, it's, it's perfection and beauty. In the same way, I guarantee you, when Elaine closed her eyes in death, she opened them immediately in the presence of Jesus. And Jesus will escort Elaine and all who put their faith in him to the Father and say, this is my daughter, this is my son. And the way we will look before the Father is more than perfect, more than glorious, like more than any bride on any wedding day. 
Of course we have sinned. Of course we're not perfect. But Jesus took care of all that. I think that's why Jesus says, you know, you don't need to live in the slavery of fear of death. We have a living hope. We have a certain hope. We have a confident hope. I mean, the question is, well, then how? How do we get that hope? The psalmist simply says, create a, create a clean heart, O oh God, in me. Renew a right spirit in me. It's like the thief on the cross who in faith just reaches out to Jesus and says, I can't do it. Would you please do it for me? Romans chapter 3, verses 22 through 25 through the New Living Translation. It's a translation I know that Elaine liked to read. It says this. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who they are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. I think, friends, we make it too complicated, don't we? If I'm going to follow Jesus, well, man, I've got I to gotta stop doing all these things, and I've got to start doing all these things. Like, No, just turn to Jesus. Just realize your need for Jesus and ask him to forgive your sin. Invite him into your life, and he says, I got it then. From there, we'll get you to the end. Because what I start, says Jesus, you can be sure of this, I will finish. Let's pray. Father, today is, is a hard day. It's a sad day. We thank you for giving a lane to us in our lives. Um, we've talked about her characteristics and how she's influenced so many, and there's much more that can be said we know. You know, in all these, the thing that's um, overriding the common theme is her love for you. Jesus and we know that that wasn't just something that she did on Sunday and then lived differently it was her whole, whole life and so Lord we thank you for the truth of your word today that when we say goodbye to a loved one when we ourselves die that's not the end it's the beginning so I pray for everyone here today Lord you know their heart if, if today's the day when they're thinking about their own eternal salvation that you would invite them to reach out to you in faith Lord, I'm so thankful that it doesn't have to be complicated. It's very simple. You know our hearts, and when we reach out to you, you respond. Thank you for being our good shepherd. Thank you, Lord, as we've talked a few times about the illustration of the horse. That Thank you that we can just drop the reins, Jesus, and you know how to take us safely to where we need to be. Continue to guide us. Continue to heal us as we grieve the loss of our friend. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Randy, for that wonderful message of hope. At this point, we'll begin to close off the service and uh, bring another good friend of Elaine's up forward, uh, Carol, as uh, she will read a very, um, a very good poem that many of us know well, and it's actually printed, and you have it in your hands. It's I'm Free. <laughs> a few weeks ago I had to share the news with our Sunday school class that we might need to rearrange our teaching schedule because Elaine was not feeling well and in her email she said to me make sure you speak up <laughs> and those of you who know me know what she meant so that people with old ears like mine could hear you. And when, Elaine, and when Randy asked me to read the poem, those words kept coming at me. <laughs> so Randy, as I told you earlier, I pray that I do this justice for you and for Elaine. 
Elaine gave this poem to Randy to be read at this service. It is a wonderful reminder and a beautiful encouragement for each of us. I'm thankful it was given to me in bold, large print, and you each have it inside your program this morning. But we need to remember that Elaine wanted us to know. Don't grieve for me, for now I am free. I'm following the path God laid for me. I took his hand when I heard him call. I turned my back and left it all. I could not stay another day to laugh, love, work, or play. Tasks left undone must stay that way, but I have found my peace at the close of day. If my parting has left a void, fill it with remembered joys. A friendship shared, a laugh, a kiss, these are things that I will miss. But be not burdened with times of sorrow. I wish you the sunshine of tomorrow. My life has been full. I have savored much. Good friends, good times, and a loved one's touch. Perhaps my time seems all so brief. Don't lengthen it now with undue grief. Lift up your hearts and share with me. God wanted me now. He set me free. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this service. We thank you for your servant, Elaine, friend, a loved one that connected with us on so many different levels. In a strange way, Lord, we thank you for her struggles in her life because that made her into who she is. And Lord, throughout all those struggles, she now appears before you enjoying know more of our struggles even more. Lord, help us as uh, we begin to um, leave this place and move forward with our lives and uh, lives with a, a void in it without her. Lord, we ask for your healing blessing to be uh, on Randy, upon us, as uh, we grieve and we go throughout that time, but we grieve not with no hope. Lord, for we know that you are faithful. And you began a good work in her a long time ago. And Lord, you completed it. So Lord, I just pray for your grace, your mercy upon us. And uh, we thank you for this service. May all glory and honor always be yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Now before you leave, we have a few closing announcements. Thank you so much, Pastor Wolf, and thank you, uh, Bishop Sizemore, for officiating this morning, um, and thank you for all uh, for being here on behalf of Randy um, and participating in Elaine's uh, funeral service. The graveside service will be held um, promptly at 1.30 at Huff's Church Union Cemetery in Albertus, and um, at this time, we will dismiss you row by row, and you're all invited to join Randy downstairs for some light refreshments and to continue celebrating Elaine's life. Thank you again for being here, and please travel safely home.